Excuse me. I'd like privacy with my question, if you don't mind. Then you should ask it in private. This is Susan Bassey. There will always be people who don't understand about the right to record in public, the right to record police officers in their official capacity, and that there is no expectation of privacy when you're in public, especially when you're asking police officers a question. Yeah, I know. If, if I know you're in a public, public place, place yeah. you can take this to all the people they want to. Yeah, you can record, understand. film, but photo, blah, It gets to be a, a little too much because this has been going on ever since I've been here. You've been filming us, me over there, you've been filming everything. It gets to be a little bit. Right, I, I, under, I understand. Kind of These are the same people that call recording in public harassing or threatening. And we find that particularly true when we're dealing with lawyers. And, yeah, but that, that's not, there's no, like, penal code. Oh, that, I know. I know there is, and unfortunately. Right. And we're talking about... I'm not saying you can't be. Did you know that it's actually a penal code to interfere with unpublished journalistic work? The First Amendment so protects the right of the free press to news gather, which means getting information, recording in public, doing interviews, asking questions, getting public records, because all of that is news gathering activity that journalists use. And police officers and government officials are not allowed to search, seize or issue warrants for that work, or it's a crime if they do. And I didn't know you were from a news place, so I would have no idea. I'm a journalist. Okay, that's fine. I've written things up, too, that for Los Gatos. I've lived here my whole life. Okay. But I just was, and I was curious if you were a journalist. It would be nice if you had a, something to see. Journalism is messy, and it's often not understood by the average person on the street, police officers, lawyers, and judges. But sometimes we find attorneys who surprise us, who welcome journalism and understand the importance of it, especially in places like the Court of Appeal. Because here, judges will rule on the words that we say and whether those words are criminal in nature or harassing. The judges that have taken place over the last few years. And I have photographed this area many, many times coming in and out of the Court of Appeal but it is time to start explaining what these judges do and how it affects your lives. Are you guys broadcasting it on the screen? Yes, it will be up on that screen once uh, I'm Because I'm a long ways out, so can I do this and then sit and wait until my case is called? Yeah, your pockets yeah, totally. and everything, no cell phones. Oh, yeah. California still criminalizes the recording of public court proceedings. You can't record inside a courtroom without a judge's permission. And if you record a remote trial court proceeding, you could be prosecuted as well. And judges make that announcement at the beginning of every hearing. But in the 6th District Court of Appeal in San Jose, California, if you go to the front waiting room area where they broadcast the proceedings, you can record those proceedings. And I'm going to show you why that's important and why we need cameras in all courtrooms, not just the Court of Appeal. Let me know if it's too loud or too soft. So nobody's in that courtroom. They're all appearing remotely? No, there's, uh, they're sitting up here. The reason that it is important for the public and the media to watch these public court proceedings is because judges will make orders that become law and because the issues at the center of all of these cases, even about words and opinions and ideas, may impact all of us. Far greater consequences and of course now he would have to self-report, were you ever found responsible? This case caught my attention because it appeared to involve four text messages and two students from Stanford University. And those text messages were now going to be evaluated and ruled on by three judges who have the power to criminalize speech. Um, so in, in this case, your position seems to be the department became aware of the investigation and the conduct underlying this HR investigation. And this is the attorney for Stanford University, and she is arguing about somebody's conduct and behavior that was judged based on four text messages. 
So am I understanding, I'm sorry, but am I understanding you this morning to be um, acknowledging that there is a connection there? Oral argument is like the Super Bowl in the Court of Appeal. It's when attorneys get to argue and judges get to ask questions. And when it's all over and done, the judges will issue a decision that becomes law that will bind all the rest of us to have to follow it without the public having any say about what that law means or how it impacts us. We don't find John credible, and uh, I, I don't think that it's a fair assessment to say that that is a one-sided report. There any other change that would, that would have accounted for Stanford's action and their own... And this should show exactly why we need cameras in courtrooms, because I went into that court proceeding to listen to what was being said, and it was so important that I thought I needed to leave and go out into the lobby area where I could record what the lawyers were saying rather than just simply report on it myself. And so when I got to the lobby, I could still see myself sitting in the courtroom, and I was able to capture the very argument that I was interested in sharing with everybody else. I am here. <laughs> I wasn't there when I was filming it. The reason it's important to have reporters covering the courts are for the same reasons that it's important to put cameras in these courtrooms. We are the witnesses to history, and that includes our legal history that is contained in the court files and the oral arguments in these courtrooms. Okay, Rodriguez was shared interpreter with two defendants, correct? Correct. We have three here. Correct. Um, Rodriguez was post-trial. And admittedly, there are things that journalists do as part of the news gathering process that doesn't have anything to do with cameras in courtrooms, because if we just relied on cameras, we wouldn't be able to do this. You're the lawyer for the Stanford, yes. um, and I, I watched your, your argument today. Was that, I, I'm probably going to do a little report, report on it, I'm a journalist, and I saw both of your argument, do you think that was a lot of judicial resources to spend over text messages and emails? I'm not going to comment. Thank you. Do you mind talking to me for a minute? Sure. So I appreciated your argument, and I've been covering... Um, what do you cover? I'm, I'm an independent journalist. Thank you. And every once in a while, we find that attorney, the little treasure that appreciates journalists and the work that we do in covering the courts. And these are the lawyers that understand the importance of public participation in our court proceedings. From the interpreter for the witness to his client. That's correct. And the trial court, had it disagreed, could have stopped and done some fact-finding, but instead just said, that doesn't matter. Just like every industry, attorneys vary by their specialty, whether they're privately paid by Stanford University or whether they're paid by taxpayers, such as public defenders. Susan Bassey and I'm a journalist, and we're both investigative reporters, so we've done a lot of investigative. We work on mostly family court, but relations to criminal court. Okay. And so I don't know if you are aware, the case that you were just doing, what, what county was it from? Sure, it's Santa Cruz County. I'm the public defender of Santa Cruz County. Okay, you did a very nice job. The people of Santa Cruz County are very lucky to have you. So I don't know if you know this, but in um, Santa Clara County years ago, we reported on the interpreter shortage that was going on. So it was yes. interesting to us that you were arguing these kinds of issues in a criminal case. We had a terrible shortage of interpreters in Santa Cruz County. And I think it's also interesting and troubling that the court weighed in with a letter to this court basically expressing um, that this court should consider how difficult it is to get interpreters and how expensive and crippling it would be with the court system to provide one for each of the accused. And while I can understand why the CEO of the court might make such a transactional argument, as somebody tasked with safeguarding the lives and liberties of vulnerable people, it's an affront to me that we would think about this in dollar and cents instead of what's at stake, which is the life and liberty of people accused of serious crimes. So it's my position. But the record here is interesting in that I've never been on a case where the court chimed in and said, if you find for the petitioner, you are going to cripple court operations, essentially, right? And therefore, you shouldn't do it. That's just not how justice works. And we already have issues with court reporters and budget issues on those kinds of things. Simple fixes might be cameras in courts, which is what I advocate for. 
After conducting this interview, we reached out to the 6th District Court of Appeal and obtained the record from Santa Cruz County from the court CEO or business person. They said that they have a million dollars a year set aside to provide interpreters for everybody going through the courts in the county who needs one. And when the money's gone, there's no more availability to provide interpreters. And so if you don't speak English as your first language and you find yourself involved in a criminal case and being prosecuted for a crime or involved in a divorce case, having to fend for yourself and play your own lawyer to divide your community property or get custody of your children, you might not have an interpreter. And arguably, that would be a denial of fairness in the courts and of due process that there was no constitutional right to an interpreter. I mean, they were really firm on trying to say that. Do, were you aware that LA County is under a uh, federal consent decree because of their problems with interpreters? For over a decade, the federal government has known about the issues related to a lack of interpreters in California's courts. And yet, despite these severe civil rights violations, it's been allowed to go on. I'm not surprised, it's really hard to find skilled interpreters in California. But the burden um, for that should not fall on people accused of crimes in a system which, as we know, predominantly prosecutes. We went on to talk about prosecutions and the marginalized people and vulnerable people who are prosecuted in criminal court. But we also talked about family court, where I have repeatedly seen people not be afforded interpreters. We talked about the shortage of court reporters, but we talked in general about a lot of issues facing public defense. And not every public defender will turn and speak to me. In fact, in Santa Clara County, they have a policy that the public defenders are not allowed to speak to me or any member of the media unless they go through their supervisor, Molly O'Neill, who is currently in charge of the public defender's office and who was also a member of the Secret Bar Bench Media Police Committee, where she was speaking regularly with members of the reporting team from the San Jose Mercury and NBC News but not other freelance reporters. Let alone to not have one at the elbow, you're already working at a disadvantage. And so when you compound the situation with just the panoply of problems that existed, like they said, over 13 days, 15 months, COVID in the middle, folks became masked toward the end with two incentivized witnesses who were the key to the people's theory of murder. And just like any other industry, there are some good lawyers and some bad lawyers, and there are also the lawyers who speak to journalists and try to explain some of the more complex issues related to the courts. Because this is the first time I've heard incentivize witnesses. And consistent with our each one teach one philosophy, this attorney taught me something, the power of words and how you use them and why they matter is basically being paid for their testimony. Right. They have a strong incentive. Right. So informant sounds like maybe more of a do-gooder. Snitch sounds like maybe it's somebody who saw something true and is reporting what happened. Incentivized witness is somebody whose testimony is bought and sold, and they will say whatever they need I to say. I loved it. It was an... Get- and there it was, an incentivized witness, whether it's criminal or family court, somebody willing to say anything, even if it's a lie, to spend less time in jail, or maybe to get what they perceive as a fair hearing in family court. That's right. It was good. So that's what we had here. We had two witnesses who are lying to save themselves from a life in prison. And who among us can say that we wouldn't do the same? That statement was perhaps one of the most important statements an attorney has ever made to a journalist covering the courts. Who among us can say that we wouldn't do the same?